Hey yo, so I recently chatted with Alan Brunton, the CEO of a startup called Cymatrax. Alan is planning to launch an app that scrubs white noise and bad frequencies from audio files and replaces them with better frequencies. If you know anything about the history of the podcast here or have been a listener since its inception, you probably heard me talking about experimenting with frequencies myself, which I've done since the jump. I've recorded episodes at 432, 528, and now 320 hertz, as opposed to the standard 440 or 441. And Alan is approaching this app with the same sort of mentality. There's a long history of frequency manipulation and sound weaponization against populations, some of which we'll get into, but the intent of this chat is not to delve too deep into the history or the conspiracy of this subject, but instead to focus on a practical, modern solution to a damn near undetectable problem that affects us all. So with that in mind, please do enjoy this chat with Cymatrax founder and CEO, Alan Brunton. Alan Brunton, thanks for being here, man. I really do appreciate your time. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've I'm, I'm really been looking forward to this for weeks. <laughs> yeah, we had a little hiccup. We thought we were going to talk two weeks ago, and then I was like, no, sorry. Didn't mean to, didn't mean to postpone it on you. But uh, <laughs> so... Alan, you are the founder of Cymatrax. We'll get to what that is momentarily, but I wanted to start with a preface because there's two stories I'd like to tell here. The first one is yours and how you came to be here, potentially on the verge of a massive breakthrough in not only technology, but also human cognition and overall health and wellness, and probably a slew of other fields as well. The second story is the details, you know, the effect of sound, frequency, and vibration on human health, on human genetics, even the history of the weaponization of sound and frequency and so on. And normally I'd try to separate those and tell them one at a time, but I think it's best to just weave in and out of both and see where this goes. I do want to start with you and how you got here on the other end of a Skype call with me. So what's your background, Alan, for the audience, and how did it lead you to this idea known as Cymatrax? Well, I started in music back when I was five years old. My grandmother asked me to sing, so I started singing. The next thing I know, I sang all the way through school, sang into high school, did very well with that Texas Old State Choir two years in a row, went and got scholarship offers from all over for applied vocal music to sing opera. And I got into singing opera all through college, sang with the Dallas Opera for nine seasons, Washington, D.C. I got invited to go over to sing at the Vatican and... Music it just touched me, and, and I, I was very frustrated at times because the administration of some of the people I was singing for were asking me to do things that were outside of my contract or responsibilities, and I, I just didn't feel like it was the right thing for them to do. And then if I wouldn't do it, well, then they would come back and say, well, he's just difficult to work with. And so it gave me... A, you know, a little bit of, that's not really true. And so they had the power, and I got a little bit disenchanted with singing. So as I continued, I mean, I stayed in music. I had a, a company called Allegro Data Systems at one time, where I, I learned to be a um, an audio engineer. And I got to be an audio engineer because I had a television cooking show. And before the television cooking show, I had helped open about about uh, 25 different restaurants, nightclubs, one hotel. And I got a, a very good reputation with actually my cooking, even though my forte was front of the house. So putting all of that together, plus when I was raised in Amarillo, my father was an inventor. Now, as an inventor, I got to see things repurposed, things that were used in other areas that were not made for to be used in that area. Like I went out to my father's shop one day and I saw something from my mother's kitchen. And I said, does mom know you have that? And he just looked at me and said, don't tell her. And then also he would say, well, she wasn't using it anyway. So no, whenever then that's the kind of, of environment I was raised in. So if I see a spoon, well, what you know, people eat with a spoon, what else can you do with it? I mean, you can bend it, you can actually make it. I remember many years ago, people would take them and cut them and make them into rings and, you know, the handles and just so many other things people would use those for. So that's actually the way that I look at things in a way that this is one way this can be used. How else can it be used? So when I started then into 
back in 2009, I was going through a divorce and a friend of mine out in Florida asked me to help her open a couple of restaurants that she bought. So I went out there and in between my, my time off, I'd be walking the beach and I started seeing a lot of complementary and alternative healthcare practices. And, you know, when you're looking at people and they talk to you about metaphysics, a lot of first things that people would say would be, oh, that's just a bunch of woo woo. OK, so then I looked really closely and since I, I started seeing a lot of applications of sound therapy and sound healing, tuning forks, crystal bowls, Tibetan brass bowls, even electronic generators using specific frequencies. And I saw them being applied to muscles that were inflamed and tendons that were hurting and just an all out release of stress. And I said, OK, and I looked closer and I saw that they were all using the same frequencies. So I started thinking, well, this is kind of coincidental. And that's when I started taking off and looking at the Western modality. I said, hasn't anybody in the Western research facilities done any research on sound therapy or such? And, and when I started looking, I was finding that a lot of the clinical trial data that was out there had been doing a lot of experiments with specific frequencies and especially seeing some of the, I looked really closely and they were applying them to people and just trying to make them smart. There's an episode of Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman where Dr. Roy Kaddish Cohen over at the Oxford Neurological Research Institute applied such frequencies and it was videoed his whole clinical trial and they were able to raise the cognitive ability of the people. And I said, wow, and the name of the program of that program actually was called, Can We Make Ourselves Genius? And so I said, well, okay. And so they went on to say, but the amazing part of it was that they brought the same people back six months later to do the entire clinical trials all over again. And when they hooked them up the first time, they hooked them up with an EEG, and then they added these electrodes, and then they gave them these video games to play. They measured the EEG, and then they saw, uh, got the scores from the video games. Then they turned on these frequencies, and the EEG registered a higher cognitive ability along with their scores on the video games were higher. But at getting back to doing the same trials the second time, six months later, they brought the same people back and says, Let's do the tests all over again from day one. Their second baseline was still higher than their first, which means that with one application of specific frequencies, you can rewire your synaptic nerves, uncover the ability of your cognitive ability into a new subconscious programming. And, and that was just what hit me completely. I said, wow. So what is it we are subjecting ourselves to every day and how can we focus on making ourselves better? And that's when I looked at all of these frequencies and I just asked, wait, all of these frequencies are within all digital audio. Well, why doesn't somebody create software that will actually analyze an audio file? Because it's just X's and O's. Locate where those good frequencies are, lock on to them, and then reduce an amount of the bad frequencies in a way so that it doesn't change the quality of the recording, but still sounds the same, and the user will then have more energy, less stress, and a higher cognitive focus. And I was told, well, that's never been done. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And that's what I did. <laughs> I, I, it's been a, a four-year project for me. It took me nine months to find someone to actually be able to write the code for me. I had somebody take me down to Austin, Texas and presented me to two different groups down there at one time. One of them, uh, the founder of a company called Mag Rabbit, the CEO founder, Tommy Hoden, and then one person that he had been working with from Dell, and I believe his name was uh, Manuf Faran, he already had two PhDs in technology and software, and he was working on his MBA at MIT. And when I presented him with this idea about, hey, why don't we do this? Or why, why shouldn't somebody do this? 
Manuf just looked at me and said, it's amazing. If you can find somebody to write your code, it should go global in less than one year. I wish we could partner with you, but I can guarantee you there's not anyone at Dell that has the skill set to write your acoustic-based software. Good luck. Oh, and by the way, had you come from software, you would not have been able to think of this. And then on the other side of the sword, because you don't come from software, you're going to have some credibility issues getting this out to the market. Good luck. So that's where I'm standing right now. It's been a, a long process talking to people, meeting people, but and I do that every single day. I get involved with um, entrepreneur think tanks. I get to talk to different people. I, I get involved by watching other people pitch their software and what it does. And when I was working with uh, two different law firms doing patent searches on this, I was a little bit surprised there's nothing like my software on the market, which then also made me feel really good because there is no competition. But then again, the major venture capitalists that look at putting money into something want to see competition. Let's say there's a McDonald's and you've got a Burger King concept. That's what they want to see because they know McDonald's already works and they want to see some competition go in after it. Well, I'm the new Bitcoin. I'm the new Facebook. You know, I am so many things that have never been done before. But as uh, the guy in Austin said, digital audio, well, that's about 4.2 billion potential users. So, okay. And finally, uh, I went to Southern Methodist University trying to find somebody there to write my code and worked with the mathematics chair and a couple of other people, and we defined what kind of language, what kind of code, what kind of programs to write the algorithm and put it into use. And then after, put it up on the job board, and I told people what the potential was, and I got over 1,200 resumes back, and not one of them had the complete requirements that I needed. And finally, my attorney put me in contact with somebody here locally. And the guy is like a software scientist. He gets into theoretics of so many different aspects of, of writing code. You know, he's one of these, he's like a savant. When he's talking and thinking, he just can't even look you in the eye. He's just going off to the side. But he just rolls and rolls and gets things going. So he actually did finish the code for me. And um, now that he is building the support software around that so that we can launch this as an app and uh, just get it out to the market. And as soon as venture capitalists see that we have over 2,000 downloads, then they're going to come knocking on the door and say, who are you? What are you doing? How much do you need? We're really confident in this also because we're going to launch it only for Android users. Because the, the uh, iOS code writing, of course, is a little bit more expensive to be able to have that. And I put a quarter million dollars of my own money into it. So with that in mind, I just need some more funding. And you know, well, they're going to cry. The, the, the Apple people are going to cry foul. So they're going to say, OK, well, what about us? And I'll say, well, I mean, if I get some more money in, sure. And then somebody will come up and say, well, how much do you need? Let me back up here for a moment because you dropped this nugget about your dad. And I, I was super interested in that because I heard you yeah. talk about it, not at length, but just briefly. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So he yeah. was an inventor who was using some sort of technology developed by Nikola Tesla. Correct. And I know you've mentioned in other interviews you were interested at one point in maybe producing a screenplay about his story. So yeah. what kind of tech was he using? Like what kind of experiments was he doing? Is that something that you can talk about? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I can talk about that. See, my dad was raised on a dairy farm in um, Oklahoma and his father died. Well, actually my dad contracted scarlet fever and lost his hearing at the age of three. So it closed him in to be a deep thinker. And then his father died at the age of nine well, as the oldest boy, he had to go out and milk all the cows, separate the milk, feed all the hogs, and do all of that. So he was very much, like I said, closed-minded all the time. Well, at the age of, I believe, 20, 
And you have to think, this is way back then. I'm 62. My dad was 30 years older than me. No, 32. Anyway, they finally took a drop cord from the house out to the barn. And they finally had a light hanging out there whenever he was 20 years old. And as he was sitting there milking, looking at that light, he started thinking, what can I do with this? I mean, this energy. And, and so actually he thought and thought, and he invented the world's first electric milking machine. The only problem was that he forgot to ground it. So whenever he plugged it in, the cow went Bleh, and died right there on the spot. <laughs> that sucks. And, and he took the machine out back and uh, buried it. And it was only about... 12 years later before my grandmother figured out what really did happen to old Red. But no, as dad went further, he, he was still tinkering around with things and he became a electrical chemical engineer. And he attended college for that and uh, patented some things. But the interesting part though was in the early 60s when he started reading um, on uh, Nikola Tesla's concepts. And so one of the first things that he built was a rainmaking machine. Now there is a Facebook page that shows his rainmaking machine uh, that I have put up and it's got a picture of that. His name was Don, uh, initial L, Brunton. And so that's up there, people can see that picture. And it, it's a great story of how dry farmers hired him to be able to cause it to rain down by La Mesa, Texas. And he had a contract with them, and halfway through the contract, they were supposed to pay him. And they said, no, it's just an act of God. We're not going to pay you anything. And the, it, he had caused it to rain, or the rain had come. You know, scientifically, what do we say? But the rain did come, and so he went and had to sue them for that money. And so they went to court, and the judge looked at my father and said, there's no scientific basis on that. It's never been done before, so case dismissed. And so my father literally got laughed out of the courtroom. Well, he got so pissed off that he went out to the fields, turned his machine on, and left it on. And the rains came and never stopped. And it flooded all the farmer's crops. And so they sued him. It went back to the same court. And the judge says, wait a second, guys, I've already ruled on this. You can't have it both ways. So that was one aspect. And he just found so much back in, when I was going to school, kids used to make fun of me because it was put in all the newspapers. So dad took this and he decided he was going to use Tesla technology in another area. And he made a, a process of using high voltage generators, creating anhydrous ammonia from the air on a plow being pulled by a tractor and immediately putting it into the ground as fertilizer for farmers. Well, he was undercutting the chemical manufacturer by 92%. And the FDA came out and said, whoa, 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 you can't do that. Uh, you have to have clinical trials because you're dealing with a food source. And that's gonna take you anywhere from four to six years. And then we'll look at it, and possibly give you approval to use this. In the meantime, Dad had to feed a family, so he went and did something else. In the 70s, he, he went from these large generators down to smaller generators, and we were using them. Actually, Dad made a way to, and did more research, found out that ozone kills pneumonia, or bacteria that causes pneumonia. So in Amarillo, there was only two people that had, or three people that had money, bankers, farmers, and ranchers. So, Dad, then we made these ozone generators and put those up into sick pen areas for sick cattle that had pneumonia, or commonly known shipping fever back then. So, you know, the cattle that were shipped in on those cattle trucks with the slits all the way through them, going through the snow and ice, they would get pneumonia in the lungs and required a lot of antibiotics to kill that. Well, with ozone, they required... 85% less antibiotics. And he had installed these, or we had installed, I guess about 31, 32 of these machines in the fall of 73, spring of 74, and going into the summer of 1974. And we had back orders for these things. We had about 20 more orders 
people wanted them as soon as possible. And one July, Monday morning, we went to the plant to start work again and to get to the plant door and there's chains and padlocks all over the, the plant door with a note on there that said cease and desist, once again, from the FDA. So what they had done on a Friday night, they had broken into the plant, opened the files, found out where every single machine was installed, and went out on Saturday and Sunday and confiscated every single machine. And what had happened was that the pharmaceutical rep went to the rancher and said, okay, how many antibiotics you need this year? And the rancher said, I don't need none. I got here this machine, paid $500 for it, and it's guaranteed for life. Yeah. So yeah. the pharmaceutical rep goes back to the company and says, I can't make my quota. Pharmaceutical company sent a lobbyist to Washington, D.C., and he went to the senator and said, here, put this onto this bill that's getting ready to pass. And they said, well, what is it? He said, don't worry about it. No one's going to question the thing. And so it did pass without anybody even looking at it. It was against the interstate transport of ozone. I mean, now you can buy an ozone generator at Brookstone. Yeah, that's so crazy. That's what dad did. And, and he actually, the last thing before his health took really bad was he processed, uh, he had came about a process to use Tesla technology and another technology so that he was getting 85 miles per gallon on a 1971 Ford F100 pickup truck. And that's another story that goes into the movie drama script that I can't talk about right now. <laughs> that's fine. I just thought it was interesting, you know, that your dad was interested in and dabbling in Tesla technology. And here, all these years later, you're essentially doing the same thing. You know, the famous Tesla quote, if you want to know the secrets of the universe, think in terms of frequency and vibration. So here you are doing exactly that. It's an interesting connection to what your dad did somewhat. So let's talk about how electromagnetic frequencies or EMFs, let's talk about how they work with or work on the central nervous system. And let's start with metabolism because this is what it sounds like to me. Metabolism sounds like it's an electromagnetic process. Is that accurate as far as you know? Well, the, the way that we've approached this is a little bit different. The reason, okay, the, the name of my company, Sinotrax, is a combination of two words. T-R-A-X, short for Tracks of Music, and then C-Y-M-A for Cymatics, which is the observation of how we see sound move matter. And everyone has seen the video of the stereo speaker on its back with a metal plate on top, pour fine sand on it, turn on an amplifier, and turn on a frequency generator. And if you look really close at that metal plate, the horizon of it, you'll see the sand is bouncing up and down, until you modulate to a specific frequency. And once you get to a specific frequency, that sand will turn into a geometric pattern. Continue to modulate and it'll go back to a blob. Continue to modulate and it'll turn into a different geometric pattern. Well, that, this is the process that we show how a signal from a frequency will travel efficiently through the central nervous system in a process called signal transduction. And in this, it goes through the cytoplasm efficiently and goes straight through the central nervous system, communicating with the brain. The other stuff, the, the, the white noise, the stuff that bounces has no direction and it just sits there and vibrates. I was speaking with a, a man this morning about it and, and he was talking about stress and agitation to the central nervous system. And he was looking at a great deal of stress, but the way that we look at the use of white noise is that white noise actually does create a type of stress in the central nervous system that has a subtle vibration. And so that's a part of the reason why people listen to white noise to go to sleep is because the brain is like a computer and when you're running three or four different programs, everything is fine until you upload huge amounts of data. And that's what white noise is. Within a spectrum of frequencies, it is millions of different frequencies. And the brain is going to analyze all of that. So it slows everything else down that's being processed by the ability of the brain. 
That's the reason why the, these other things you're thinking about slow down and you're able to then just have a type of low level vibration in the central nervous system and be able to go to sleep. Now, as I said, all of those frequencies, and as I said, the, the Western modality that I've looked at has been from Johns Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, Harvard School of Medicine, MIT, and the Oxford Neurological Research Institute, and where they have taken specific frequencies and applied them to their, their test subjects and shown and measured a raised cognitive ability. On my website, uh, simatrax.com, there is a tab that says about the science. And there is a clinical trial report from the National Institute of Health showing the detriment of applying white noise to yourself and how your cognition goes down, how you do induce a type of stress within the central nervous system, and then how your ability to create other essential chemicals like dopamine in the system has been reduced as well. So what you're doing actually with the white noise and here's the, an, another amazing part. It's not just through, the, through a pair of headphones. This can actually go through the epidural as well, through the exterior of your skin. That's the reason why when you go to a, a concert and you walk out of a concert, whether it's a symphony or the Rolling Stones, you walk out of there going to your car, your whole body is still vibrating. And it does that for you know, 20, 30 minutes, maybe a couple of hours but we don't, we've not measured how long that vibration continues in the central nervous system. We don't know how long it takes before you actually can calm yourself down and go to sleep, or whether or not it's just such a huge impact that you finally get home or wherever your, your final destination is, and you just sort of pass out from exhaustion. Now, the EMFs, I, I've really not looked at too much. All I'm looking at, though, is the straight frequencies in digital audio. Okay. I guess I was just thinking of it in terms of like, and maybe I phrased that question in the wrong way. I guess I was trying to think of like how, because EMFs are prevalent in the environment, and there's no definitive separation between the frequencies in our body and the frequencies outside of our body. Like we have no barrier, essentially. Right. So... I guess I was wondering, like, what would the effect on what's going on in the environment have on our central nervous system? And if what you do could be applied, I guess, to a larger scale. But I guess we're just talking about audio tracks then. So we're not talking about a full, you know, central nervous protection barrier of some sort. Yeah, we've got to learn to take, you know, uh, steps to be able to control our environment. And you know uh, the work of uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, right? Yeah. Okay, so... You know, whenever he talks about epigenetics, he, he goes into the understanding that the body is influenced and the cells in the body are influenced by four influences, chemical, heat, light, and sound. And in the sound area, there's so many different kinds that we are not addressing. And one of those is, as I said, the digital aspect, because over 4.2 billion people listen to digital audio in some one way or another. That is what I have learned how to control. The architecture of the software that I designed and then had my software scientist write the code for is in a way that we can actually target specific frequencies. And those are like within a, a small box and we can go and change those. Now, whenever I talked to a friend of mine, a dear friend who is like a leading pediatric neurologist at University of Texas Southwest, she got everything I was talking about immediately and believes we can use the architecture of my software, change the targeted frequencies to other frequencies from another clinical trial, and we can use this to treat autism. So that's huge thinking about it for a while, and since I was trying to get this out just to the general public, I contacted Autism Speaks about six or seven months ago and said, hey, I've got this. Do you want it? You, would you like to use it for clinical trials? And they said, thank you very much, but we don't do clinical trials. We raise money for people to do clinical trials, but we got a guy for you in Dallas. And that's when I contacted and met uh, a man Dr. Craig Powell, who has the 
Palo Laboratories at UTSW, has worked with my friend, uh, the pediatric neurologist, and when I showed him clinical trial data, he actually wrote back to me and said, yes, this is what you're saying is, is logical. So, yeah, I would love to be able to do your clinical trials. So he got a, um, a, a way to control a social trial, and that's what I'm working with uh, Southern Methodist University right now on, is to find a candidate in the MBA program at the Cox Business School to be able to take my software and then write his thesis paper on how this application of sound will be beneficial to the, generate a higher output productivity in the workplace. So he is going to get like 20 college students, take their playlist, run it through the software, and then we'll do a simple six-day trial of three days on, three days off, the, the user won't know which is which. And we will then, like Dr. Powell said, we will record all of their responses. And if we get just 20, no, I'm sorry, 55% positive response to your application, that is enough to be able to submit to the scientists at Autism Speaks. And they can fund us then anywhere from one to $3 million to be able to run the trials on autism. So that's very encouraging. And as I said, I met with uh, SMU people two weeks ago to go further on this, plus to get interns from them to be able to look at going in between during the summer break for them. Definitely, yeah. I mean, that's very encouraging. And I think autism is just the tip of the iceberg, though. There are tons of autoimmune conditions and diabetes, cancer. I mean, it's an endless array of things that could potentially be affected in a more positive way by your software here. Yeah, immediately, as I've talked to other neuroscientists about this, they look and they say, what you're saying is absolutely logical. It, number one, it's just amazing no one has even thought of this. Because once you show any type of positive response to autism, then it's just logical to go after Parkinson's, dementia, Alzheimer's, PTSD, ADHD, any other type of neurological disorder. And it's my ultimate goal, being a follower of Bruce Lipton's, as I am, to actually use this technology to be able to alter the switches within the DNA for when people have, let's say they have the cancer gene and they have cancer. Well, there are switches in there. People have the cancer gene and don't have cancer. And that's because the switch is actually off. Now, if we can find a way to use sound and sound, you know, because of cymatics, we're seeing that, you know, sound does move matter. If we can find a way of pinpointing this and being able to bathe someone on a daily basis in a, in a set of frequencies, and let's say they did have cancer, but we're able to turn it off. Wow, there we go. We're, we're able to look at every single disease that there is out there and, and control it. Definitely, yeah. And are you familiar with the sound experiments on water? You know, what Dr. Emoto's water consciousness and intent experiments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember seeing that the very first time in the movie, What the Bleep. And so, yeah, I, I've seen that. And, you know, he passed away a few years ago. And so many people have been trying to continue to elevate uh, his research. But, uh, no, the, it seems that the molecular structure of the water molecule actually does have memory and can hold that. Now, whenever he was in those experiments that showed up on uh, in the movie, What the Bleep, on the surface value, it looked like that when people were using words like hate and just all kinds of negative comments that the water was able to hold that. And when it came to love, it was actually showing a better way. But I think that all of that is actually a byproduct of the intention of the frequency that we generate from ourselves into an object. And I'm the kind of guy that does not think that uh, I don't like to call love an emotion. I think that love is just energy. And we, when we love someone, we're putting our energy out to them. 
then again, we do have positive and negative energies as well. But whenever two people then are in love, and that's whenever the Taurus fields are able to combine and talk to each other in a way that there is a communication. You know, whether the communication from one to the other activates pheromones and hormones and all kinds of chemical activations, well, yeah. But in the meantime, I, I think that is just why and how successful relationships work with each other is because the two people are in tune with each other's frequencies. Yeah, and you know, speaking of frequencies, I wanted to I wanted to make sure that we drop some historical knowledge here about the history of the weaponization of sound and frequency. And I don't know how far back it really goes, but I know that it goes back to at least Nazi Germany, and they were using frequency to yeah, they were using frequency to manipulate the population, and then later were able to get those same frequencies adopted worldwide. Tell us what you know about that. Well, one of the people that actually found that studied frequencies goes further back, I guess around 1880, 1882. The great father of Italian opera was Giuseppe Verdi. And he was so popular that everybody wanted him to come to their town and conduct his opera on their stage. Well, Verdi found a way that, okay, but too much rehearsal, I need to bring my best people with me. And so when he brought his people there, the tuning was so different. Verdi had come to a point where he preferred to tune to 432 hertz. And so whenever they went somewhere, it took a long time for everybody to tune from whatever frequency was their concert A to what Verdi's preference was. I mean, think about it. Trying to tune a pipe organ or a harpsichord or a piano, it, it just took so much time. But anyway, that was his choice preference of concert A. Well, going then into the mid-30s, as Uncle Adolf was getting ready and trying to take over the world, some scientists came to him and said, you know, if you change concert A from 432 to 440, there'll be a vibration in which people will be able to be in a type of trance, and they will be more susceptible. But if you play the music concert A at 440 hertz, they'll be more susceptible to your propaganda and the way you're going to tell them that you want Nazi Germany to grow. So Adolf said, give it to Goebel. He's my propaganda guy. And so he made sure that from every city they went to then and took over, that they changed concert A from whatever it was to 440 hertz. And that is the, the vibration, you know, it, it, within it, it's... It doesn't have the pure tone that travels efficiently through the central nervous system. That's the reason why that they continued to have uh, symphonies playing all the time out throughout every single country that, that Nazi Germany took over. The, the amazing part about this was, though, that Great Britain, England, actually had found out about this as well. So they, in 19, I think, 38 or 39, had all of their orchestras going to 440 hertz as well, so that they could instill the, the, the commitment of the English people to go forward and protect their land no matter what cost. So they were actually using the propaganda on their own people to be able to you know, save, save our queen, save our king at the time. Then after the war was over, all the discoveries and of all these amazing things that they were doing in the laboratories in Nazi Germany uh, were discovered and looked at and evaluated. And in 1951, there was, and this is as far as I got into the research, and it was documented that a funding organization sent a message to the International Standards Organization requiring them to set the concert a pitch frequency at 440 hertz. And some people say, well, that's just a bunch of hogwash. It can't be conspiracy. And then you just have to look it back and say, well, then why did they choose that frequency? Why didn't they just use another one? Scientists aren't like that. People that are in power and control aren't like that. They have to have a reason for it. So the reasoning for this was because they got hold of the documentation and they saw 
you know, we can control people by doing this. I, I spoke with a television producer here in Dallas. Uh, WFAA is the leading ABC affiliate. And when I told him about my software, he said, what you're doing is absolutely brilliant, but we can't use it at the station because we add a white noise track to the audio so that when the it puts the type it puts the viewer in a type of hypnotic trance so that whenever they're watching they won't reach for the remote control to change the channel so our Nielsen ratings go up so we can charge more to the sponsor and when I did a podcast three months ago the very next day I had a, a, a man who owns a recording studio in Los Angeles call me up he asked can I send you a couple of my files? You run it through your software and send it back to me? I said, sure. When I told him this story, he said, oh, yeah, every single television station does that because they want to make sure they hold you on, too. I mean, think about why is it that the Beverly Hillbillies and I Love Lucy reruns are still on the air? The sound quality was so obnoxious that it's, it's almost just like that constant hissing. And that's the reason why people just say, yeah, okay. And they just allow it to continue to run and run and run. But the, the one thing, though, I, I know you've got another direction you want to go, but going back to that uh, man in Los Angeles, when I sent him his files, his treated files back to him, he called me back the next day, 24 hours later, and he told me, I just got to tell you what happened. I, I took the files and I listened to them and I knew something was different and I couldn't quite pinpoint what it was. So I took them down to the studio and I had my chief audio engineer listen to them inside of the recording uh, studio itself. And within 30 seconds, he looked up at me, dropped his jaw and his eyes were wide open and said, what did you do to these? They have so much more energy. So we're talking to several different areas of being able to license the technology we have out to the, the to the studios, which is probably where the main effect is going to be by way of business. But in the meantime, we're still looking at being able to just launch this as a free app, and we'll probably launch it and cut off the free part once we hit about 250,000 downloads or maybe even a half million. And then we'll start charging anywhere from 99 cents to a buck 99 for on a monthly subscription, just as soon as we show social acceptance of this. And the target audience we'll go after to begin with will be the meditation app market. Uh, and that's a $250 million a year industry right now. I've contacted the top 10 and not one of them has any clinical trial data. So they're just going mainly on a word of mouth endorsement from person to person. I mean, there's Headspace has quite a few Hollywood celebrities that are using uh, their subscription right now because they're saying, well, yeah, it, it, it really calms me down. Well, that's what white noise does. It calms you down, and especially if you're playing tracks of, of music that don't have any words to it, or, you know, it's like spa music, meditation music. Some people even say, yeah, the, the music of Enya, even the words that she sings a lot of the times you know, in Gaelic, you don't understand them, so you just sort of go, okay, yeah, I'm just let this flow. I, I'm just going so many different directions, and I want to continue to follow with what your question is. Well, I think the question I asked was about the Nazis, which is fine, because you did take us down that path. But, you know, I know we're about towards the end of our time here, so I just want to wrap up with the specific frequencies that we're talking about. You mentioned 440, and I think 441, pretty detrimental frequencies. But what are the beneficial frequencies that you know of that you're trying to either identify or replace in these audio files? Well, in, in, in that aspect, I, I'm, I've got to hold off and say that is almost a type of proprietary information for the company. I spent two years going through all of this clinical trial publications from these major healthcare organizations, and a lot of that I had to subscribe to and then get permission to go into and look down into things that were, they were published, but they weren't. They were just sort of like for their own scientific research libraries. So, I mean, it, it's out there for people to find. But because I have put two years of, of my 
time into it and not been paid for it. I'm just going to say to people, you know, it's there if you want to go find it yourself. But for, I mean, I did have a patent attorney ask me the same question. What are those good frequencies? And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you that because even though you can't patent the frequencies, it's going to hinder somebody else in case they do try to write a, a program that would be involving of patent right infringements of what we're doing. So we just want to be able to get out there to the market to be able to help people raise their cognitive ability. And whenever you look at other areas of involvement, uh, let's just say one of the things that Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about, and this is what I'm trying to do, is to meld the joining, the areas of, of taking holistic health care and metaphysics, spirituality, and bringing the science into that. And as we discover this more and more and more, we're working. Now, one of the things you didn't talk about, which I'm sure that you understand and, and remember, is the man named Royal Rife. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Rife had actually generated a way of killing cancer, curing cancer back in 1934. And then he was put and made a mockery of, very detrimentally, that actually put him out of business and put him in the poorhouse. Today, and actually just four or five years ago, it's a company called NovoCure, based out of Israel, that does have FDA approval to cure a certain type of brain cancer, neoblastoma, using sound waves. And the reasoning why that this has been accelerated is because we do have the internet now, then, which will put things out, and you can't change when that information gets out. Back in 34, Rife couldn't do that. He had no ways of communicating with people. But we do have uh, so many other companies now then that are using specific sound frequencies for healthcare. I mean, if you look at the up ramp of music therapy right now, I, I spoke with their board of directors, and they said as soon as we can get clinical trials of my software validated, then they would look then into putting my process then as part of the certification process for all music therapists. I mean, just think about that, just helping people even more and more and more into science, understanding then the holistic way of, of doing things. You know, one of the things, Alan, that I wanted to touch on here too, that you mentioned to me via email, was this process of signal transduction. Uh, that sounds like a pretty complex technical terms, so I'm not too familiar with what that is. And uh, okay, I'm sure. trying to find, there is a button on here that I can actually go to my computer, and I'm trying to think, think which one that is. All right, but you see my screen. Now, okay, so now do you see the, that house? Yep. All right, so what in the process of signal transduction that, uh, I was going to show is here. In, in the process of signal transduction, the vibration of that specific frequency goes into a receptor in the cell. And if it is a specific frequency, then as it goes into a cell, and let's just say this is the cytoplasm utilizing the, the white noise that goes through it just vibrates, and the energy of that uh, white noise itself disperses itself without having any type of direction. Over utilizing this image then for 432 hertz will actually pass the energy through efficiently through the, the receptors and through the, the cytoplasm itself, carrying that on from cell to cell through the entire central nervous system. And that will then communicate efficiently with the brain while once again as i was saying the other sounds of any other frequency in between our target frequencies disperses the energy and does nothing but cause the brain inefficiency and the cognition to be drawn away from the process of thinking and then utilizes the the lessening of your cognition are you following me now yeah, yeah. I have a question. So you said that you have targeted frequencies. 
Obviously, you're showing, you're showing a picture here on your screen that the, the listeners can't see, but it looks like a cell that's absorbing these frequencies at 432 hertz and at 440 hertz. And the difference is the 432 looks a lot, like you said, more uh, beautiful, really. It's a nice image there, but it looks like it's more focused on where the energy input output might be. And then the sound that, image on the right with the 440 hertz, doesn't it, like you said, it looks a little more sporadic and scattered. So that's exactly what happens through the cell structure itself is that the, the energy wave of that frequency disperses and causes the broadness of the yellow light. The, the other target frequency, and one of the targeted frequencies that we have been working with is 432 hertz, and then other multiples as well, then that will channel, let's say, if you look at the very center of the left hand picture, you see that the energy of the frequency itself is passing much more efficiently through the entire surface of this and goes from top to bottom. See, what we're looking at right now is, is a horizontal view. And what we're talking about is the, is the sound wave to actually go vertically. And that would be from the very top through the bottom, through the center without the disbursement of the, of the energy. The picture on the right actually shows that the energy is being absorbed inefficiently within the cellular structure itself. And the just like anything else, that the energy of that sound wave is not constant. It does not continue to go through. So that is the reason why that there is no signal going to the brain. So you mentioned cognition or increased cognition is a benefit of this. Are there any other health benefits that you know of from this sort of frequency and vibration? Because it seems like it would benefit you more than just cognitively, but I, I'm not really sure if you have studied or know anything about that. Well, the, the, we don't have uh, the clinical trials on that right now. However, we have shown that, and the numbers have actually increased that uh, I had always quoted that the CDC was reporting that 85% of all disease is caused by stress. And the stress is caused by that picture, once again, on the right-hand side, causing the cellular structure to actually vibrate inefficiently without sending a signal to the brain. But actually, just this morning, I got more verification that the CDC is now reporting that 90% of all disease is caused by stress, somewhere, somehow. And so with the application of constant white noise, it is actually inducing a type of stress within the central nervous system. Now, a lot of people have asked me, well, I listen to white noise to go to sleep at night. I mean, I got a sound of a fan on, or I've got a white noise generator on, are you telling me that that is going to harm me? And I'm saying, no, it's just reducing your ability to think. And that's the reason why you're able to go to sleep. I mean, you may have several things on your mind, but whenever you put that white noise on, you are causing the brain to stop thinking. So I okay. sleep with a fan every night, and now that generates a noise, obviously, which you might consider white noise. Is that then detrimental to my health if I'm sleeping with that? I don't know of a study of a long-term effect of it, but the only thing that brings up a constant question to me is that the trial that was done by Oxford, and that is where they had hooked up their their test participants with an EEG, and then they put electrodes on top of that that were applying specific frequencies to the brain. They measured the cognitive ability on the EEG and also gave them a video game. And the video game, uh, they measured the scoring aptitude on that. And then they after they scored both the EEG and the video game, then they turned on those specific frequencies and the cognition raised and also the scoring on the video games was higher. But the amazing part of it was 
that they brought the same people back six months later to do the tests over from scratch, from point A, and they ran a second baseline, and their second baseline cognitive ability was still higher than the first six months previous, showing that you can and do rewire your synaptic nerves with just one application of specific frequencies. Now, has this been tested with white noise, which is then shown to be detrimental? I don't know. I don't, I've been searching, and I, I can't find any kind of source on that. I mean, I remember growing up at my mother's and father's home that I would fall asleep on the couch watching a, a program. They had gone to bed, and mom gets up and goes into the living room. Well, there's nothing but a test pattern on the television, and as soon as she turns it off, I wake up. Well, once again, if, if we remember what I was telling you about the local ABC television affiliate program producer here, he said that they do add a white noise track to their audio so that it does put the viewing audience in a type of hypnotic trance so they don't change the station. So people do know, and they, there is scientific evidence out there about what white noise does and taking away from your optimal thinking capability. Now, is it long term? I can't answer that. Now, I know that the software right now is only meant to be used with digital audio files. But is this something down the road that you could see being applied to any sort of maybe device or appliance that emits a frequency that you could help clean that up with that sort of software? Yeah, I, I actually spoke with a North American vice president of sales of a silicon chip manufacturer. And he was asking then about taking the algorithm and putting that into a silicon chip. And I said, sure, why not? I mean, I would love to have my technology in every Intel chip, in every computer, or into every stereo, or into every microphone, or, you know, why not? We have the technology. The science is there now. So we talked about the Nazis using this, you know, as a, as a method of essentially population control. Are you concerned with any sort of government or heavy corporate pushback on something like this? It's funny you should ask. Just two days ago, I met the artistic director for AT&T. He brought up the same thing. He said, uh, I think that what your technology can do would be a very viable avenue to be able to control that the employers want to be able to control their employees. And so he was thinking that this is a way then that with whether they are raising their cognitive ability or lessening it, you know, we don't know what people can do with this. But about three or four months ago, without knowing, I described the entire process to a man who actually works for the Department of Defense. And he asked me for my card, and I gave it to him, and I said, oh, and by the way, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm with the DOD. And I went, oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's we don't want this to become a weapon. We, we yeah. want to help people. Well, that's the thing, though, man, is that if that was an orchestrated change from 440 or from 432 to 440 back post World War 1 or whenever that actually was i could see how you would get some interest at least from outside parties that may not want this to be distributed widely and might do everything they can to sort of squash that before it gets too popular so i was just curious if you had a plan in place you know of how to combat that perhaps it's called the internet that is yeah. a valuable tool yeah so that's how we're going to distribute it. I mean, going back to Royal Rife, you know, in 1934, whenever he was curing cancer using frequency back then, well, he got quashed because the other party, uh, the AMA, actually had all the money to be able to put out propaganda saying that Rife was a quack. Nowadays, you've got so much other funding coming in. As I said, Novocure, Israeli-based company, has FDA approval to cure a certain type of brain cancer using frequency. And where did they get their money? Well, number one, they got a distribution 
channel called the Internet. You can't stop that from going all over. Then they also raised $95 million of private funding from T. Rowe Price, and they did an IPO and raised another $165 million. And now then they have all of these satellite clinical trial areas into hospitals all over the United States. You can't quash that. It, it is going to be coming out. The same thing goes with as soon as we do the launch with the software in so many different areas, whatever the vertical application is, that information is going to go out there and people are going to start to understand, hey, yeah, I've got to have this because I know that it's, it's the best thing for my health. Once again, just like eating organic, you know, staying away from uh, fast food to be able to, and I'm not going to target any one <coughs> McDonald's uh, place that <laughs> would uh, yeah. be detrimental to your health. But we have examples of that. Well, yeah. So that Israeli company is not you know, necessarily a competitor to you and what you're doing. But do you see any competition on the horizon for what you're doing? And or do you plan to, if this finds some success, be able to branch out into maybe more of that, those health related fields? Oh, absolutely. That's where we're going right now, because I, like I said, I have two neurologists I've spoken with and both of them have stated they want to do my clinical trials so that we can use this technology, the, the software and apply it to autism. We have the capability of going into the software and changing the target files, uh, changing the target frequencies very easily. And with that in mind, we, there's clinical trial data that's out there right now showing that some specific frequencies have been shown to be very effective with uh, children with autism. So we can take those frequencies and put it into the architecture of the, fre of the uh, software I have and it can be used as a daily therapy for them, and so we can do a clinical trial there. And we have a process, uh, like I said, I've, I've been contacting SMU and their Cox Business School and uh, one of their directors of career development, and we should be getting uh, some help from them to be able to run social trials, and then after the social trials, we submit that to Autism Speaks, their scientists will take a look at it, and according to one other neurologist here in Dallas at UTSW, uh, who has been funded by Autism Speaks before, he said it'll be simple for them to okay for us to get anywhere from one to three million dollars and go in that route. And if I've explained this to other neuroscientists, they say, well, everything you're saying is absolutely logical. And then as soon as you show any type of positive nature to uh, autism, then it would be very easy to go after dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, PTSD, ADHD, any other type of neurological disorder. I kind of like to think of this as this specific signal, this, this frequency is acting like a rotor rooter going through and, and helping rewire the synaptic nerves into a validated cognitive ability that would connect any other type of neurological disorder into a mainframe of the way that the mass population operates. So the app is not out as yet when we're talking, but when do you anticipate it being out for people with Android devices to download and use then? The chief technology officer is building and testing it right now for security purposes. If people want to be able to get onto a mailing list, notification, they can come find me on LinkedIn, Alan Brunton on LinkedIn, or they can actually send me an email at info at cymatrax.com, I-N-F-O at C-Y-M-A-T-R-A-X. So with other podcasts I've done. I've got hundreds of people that have sent me requests for this already and notification of when they can start using this. I mean, I just told you that, you know, students using this for everything when they, they're listening to their music to be able to focus more on studying. Uh, we can actually license this then uh, going further down into online education 
corporate training. There's just so many applications that no one has actually looked at. And I, I wake up every morning and say, do I, have I really come up with this? And am I the first one? I mean, am I going to be like the father of, of this kind of understanding? It, it doesn't matter. I just want to be able to make my mark on being able to help um, some way humanity. At, at least I can say, you know, I did my very best. I think that's all that anyone could ever ask for, Alan. So, hey, I appreciate you hanging out for as long as you did. I know you have to run here to an appointment. So, Simatrax.com, which you've mentioned, is the place where they can keep up with you and your work. Is there any place else online that you would want to drive people to? Yeah, there's a Simatrax Facebook page. People can come find me on Facebook. And uh, the page that I've got there is uh, on Facebook slash Simatrax, I believe. Uh, I do make a little bit more comparisons to other technologies that are coming out on that Facebook page and showing why people should be much more aware of their own uh, subjection of of what kind of sound environment they're putting them on. I mean, there's there's so much stuff that has been documented from all over the world. Like, it it would just take me so long because I've, I've looked at it for years and years now. Definitely. Well, I look forward to it whenever it comes out. Unfortunately, I have an iPhone right now, but, you know, I'm not really fond of it. So we'll see what happens in the future. Maybe I'll download that on an Android for sure. Okay. Thanks, Thanks so much for having me on. No problem. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. And there you have it. My thanks again to Alan Brunton. Check out Simatrax.com if you want to keep up with what he's doing with this app. It's not out yet but I hear the release is tentatively scheduled for October on Android platforms only, and hopefully iOS not long after that. And speaking of smartphones, one of the biggest threats to our health that this app can't address is the frequencies emitted by 5G. So while it doesn't relate to this discussion with Alan, I did think it was worth mentioning because if you, say, did a week-long experiment with your phone by putting it in airplane mode every time you sleep or every time it's in your pocket or on your hip, and then after a week went back to normal, you would notice a difference. And that's really the same effect that music files, podcast files, TV and radio streams, the same effect they have on you. Not a silent killer, but an invisible one. I did want to get more into the way that frequencies affect the body, but after my question about metabolism, I shelved all the rest of them. But I do want to share some of that here because I think the information is valuable. And I guess what I was getting at in terms of metabolism was that in studies of both plants and animals, electromagnetic frequencies had a profound effect on metabolic processes. In the study of plants specifically, which was called Plant Responses to High Frequency Electromagnetic Fields, and which is linked in the show notes, that study said this about a plant's biological response to these high frequency electromagnetic fields. Quote, biological responses should be considered as reporters of and evidence for the plant's ability to perceive and interact with electromagnetic fields. These responses can take place at the subcellular level, implying molecular events or modification of enzymatic activities, or at the level of the whole plant taking the form of growth modification. Numerous reports indicate an increase in the production of melondialdehyde, or MDA, a well-known marker of membrane alteration. Reports also indicate an increase in reactive oxygen species metabolism, or ROS, after exposing plants to high-frequency electromagnetic fields. End quote. So ROS metabolism is interesting. From Wikipedia here, quote, ROS are formed as a natural byproduct of the normal metabolism of oxygen and have important roles in cell signaling and homeostasis. However, during times of environmental stress, ROS levels can increase dramatically. This may result in significant damage to cell structures. Cumulatively, this is known as oxidative stress. End quote. Okay, so if you know anything about how cancer forms in the body, in the cells, <laughs> this is it. Now, let's establish what these high-frequency electromagnetic fields are exactly. For purposes of the study on plants, they use a frequency range of 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. 5G, in comparison, will be broadcasting at a range between 6 gigahertz and 100 gigahertz. Holy shit. And to be honest, we're already being bombarded by frequencies in the plant test range because 4G is being broadcast anywhere from 700 megahertz to 2700 megahertz, which falls firmly in the range of the plant study and is definitely considered a high-frequency electromagnetic field. 
So here we have a scientifically studied and proven method of not only altering cellular function in plants and animals, but damaging it and ultimately killing it. Some of you have probably heard cancer referred to as a metabolic disease, and, well, this is why. This is how that works. There's a lot more to how these frequencies affect our cellular function too, including a recent breakthrough in how we understand communication between cells. Hint, that too is an electromagnetic process as opposed to a chemical process, as it was long thought. And it's also worth noting that cell membranes are actually liquid crystals, and brain cells specifically have a magnetic property to them. So the best way to think about your cells is each one is its own little individual antenna. So all these signals being broadcast now, whether it's through Wi-Fi or cell towers or whatever devices you're streaming Netflix or Spotify on, those signals are not only being picked up by those devices, but also by your nervous system, by your cells. So please keep that in mind and do what you can to keep yourself and your loved ones happy and healthy and protected. But anyway, I do hope you enjoyed the chat with Alan, and I do hope you give that app a try if you can. I'll be back soon with another full-length episode, but until then... You've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.